So we're going to go straight into it. Um, I, we have an exciting, exciting talk for you today. I'm really excited about it. So um, just to start off, our talk is about the intersectionality of race, gender and sexuality. Uh, my name is Obi. I'm a careers consultant here at St. Mary's. Um, I'm just going to quickly tell you what the format will be for this um, discussion. So we're going to quickly have our panelists introduce themselves and then they're going to go back in and have a um, quickly start given, I suppose, um, a personal or informed um, narrative um, from their own um, perspective around the topic of intersectionality. And then we'll have um, the floor open for to take questions um, from yourselves. Um, and we also have some pre-prepared questions as well that we'll ask our panelists. Um, before we go, I just want to say that, you know, that in, in, this is a space that we're all at different points in our journey. You know, we're all different and we're the sum of our experiences. Um, so, you know, that we are learning. So otherwise we won't be here if we didn't want to learn to know, know more and push ourselves in our growth. Um, I don't expect people to be hot on the latest lingo or, or to be politically correct. But what I do expect is that we sort of recognize compassion, um, honesty and respect. You know, we're all learning. We all want to raise each other up. And that's what, I, that's what I'm here for. And that's what should be the spirit of, of, of today about raising each other up, learning from that. And please, this is a learning space, ask questions and we'll try our best to, to answer. So without further ado, I'm going to go through my um, three panelists to quickly introduce themselves before they go into their narratives. So first is Lorraine. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming along and thank you so much at Mary's for inviting me. My name is Lorraine Jones and I'm the head of Department for Social Sciences at the University of East London. Thank you, Lorraine. Simeon? Hello everyone, good afternoon, and uh, I am Simeon Dagas, and I am the Deputy Provost at St. Mary's University, and I'm really, really excited that we have Lorraine and Dion here as well. And last, but definitely not least, is Dion. I'm Dion, I'm, the undergrad I'm doing undergraduate primary education here at St. Mary's. Thank you. And I'm a faculty rep, I think mean, I'm representing the main faculty rep too. <laughs> Thank you, Dion. So I'm going to go back to Lorraine for your narrative. OK, so um, we're talking about intersectionality today. So I would um, first of all, I'd like to break, take a moment to break down the term intersectionality. And I'd like to break it down into the adjective intersection. So for me, intersection invokes US movies where someone or something is described as being at the intersection of a street, a block or a highway. So for me, it means something or someone that meets, overlaps, crosses, runs or crashes into each other. And in that crossing or meeting or overlapping, there are advantages and disadvantages of being there. So as we may be aware, intersectionality was a term coined by Kimberley Crenshaw in 1989. And she's on YouTube and elsewhere. There are many um, clips of her on YouTube and I had the privilege of seeing her a couple of years ago in London and she explains that the term is not a grand theory but it's a metaphor and a prism to induce a way of thinking other than white hegemonic ways of thinking about multiple discriminations i.e racism gender class sexual orientation so one can look up the meaning of intersectionality quite easily to get definitions, i.e. the Oxford uh, English Dictionary and the Merriam-Webster. They give definitions, but for me, what gets lost in these definitions is the history and the context of the term. It was Crenshaw, as a black woman researcher and feminist, her inquiry into race and black women and their employment and discrimination so it was not just for Crenshaw that black women were being discriminated in terms of their employment, not just as being black or just as being women, but being black and women, she unearthed the issues of their unique intersection. So today's forum strap line, if you're not sure what it was, I thought it was amazing whoever came up with it, is we're never just one linear thing. We are the sum of multiple identities personas and experiences that shape not just how we interpret and make sense of our realities, but how society sees us, how we see society and the relationships and connections we make. 
And this gave me license to consider many things that there's so many topics I could have spoken about. But one of the hot topics for me at the moment is the acronym BAME, B-A-M-E. Some people pronounce it BAMI, BAME. Some people don't really know how to pronounce it, but anyway. And I, I want to just talk about the... Um, I know it's got Obi excited when I first started uh, saying to him that I was going to speak about it. So I want to use the term BAME as a prism of intersectionality, as, as Kimberly Crenshaw used it, to briefly ex explore it in a very short time I have. So people who know me uh, at the University of London know that at every appropriate opportunity, I bring this uh, acronym up. I find it problematic. A brief history, it, it emerged in the UK in the 1970s in a move away from the political civil rights umbrella term of black with a capital B, which had encompassed Asian and ethnic minoritized groups. And I just, I've used the term minoritized here and not minority because often we hear of ethnic minority groups and I would rather, and we could talk about that later and, and if you've got anything to say about that, that just to say minority group, it's rather to imply power that groups are minoritized. The term started off as BME, Black and Minority Ethnic, and then BAME, which is Black Asian Minority Ethnic. The problem is I've heard comments at university such as there is a BAME student who has an issue with, or there's a BAME degree awarding gap. At one meeting I was in, somebody, a colleague in HR said they had a new BAME intern, which was really good. And I questioned that colleague and said, what do you mean? And I think he was uncomfortable saying black. I mean, I knew that I knew the intern was black but he, he used it as a kind of politically correct term saying I have a BAME student. I tackled him on that. So, and he got quite flustered when I said that. So I've also heard a lecturer describe himself as a BAME academic. And personally, I find that problematic. But as Obi said, as we started off, people are on different journeys, you identify in different ways, you, you, you describe yourself in different ways. At university, staff and student data is collected and analysed in this way. So what does that term mean? What effect and impact can it have? Does anyone, and perhaps Simeon might address this, who is not BAME, who is not described typically as BAME, but who is in a position of change management, do they consider the great big holes of collecting and analysing data in this way? I teach a module on race and we spend the whole term considering what black and white means amongst many things. But I ask you here to consider how is it that we have black in this BAME acronym with melanated peoples not ascribed to a continent and indeed to the very beginning of humanity, but then we have Asian people who are ascribed to a continent. What does Asian mean in this country? Chinese, Pakistani, Indian? What are minority ethnic people or communities? In some parts of the UK, ethnic minority people are the ethnic majority. Being black and Asian are not ethnicities. Indeed, it's the fault of data collection forms that we end up like squeezing our feet into shoes that's too small for us, ticking boxes that do not fit us. The government statistical services have harmonized principle of ethnicity and they recommend 18 official ethnic groups to ensure data compatibility. Of course, there does need to be some consensus for compare, comparing data, but I find this problematic when this acronym is used in the everyday, as BAME from me is insidious in that it has come to mean non-white. And we need to problematize it when we use the term. In the UK, the largest ethnic group are the English, so therefore, Welsh, Scottish, Irish, along with Italians, Polish, Spanish, are ethnic minorities. Indeed, I'd ask, what does black mean? I mean, that's a whole other debate, which we don't have time for today. So when grouping people into the BAME category, despite the term being useful for data to an extent, it has severe limitations and it loses a lot of the nuance and therefore the impact and effect on people's lives and identities. Some issues are missed or just ignored because diversity programs produce one solution for one of the problems within BAME 
rather acknowledging them as distinct or a problem worthy of complex solution. The most striking recent findings is that the BAME communities are disproportionately dying from COVID-19. However, it's only when you are looking at the specific data of different ethnicity groups and subgroups within that, that you start to see any meaningful answers. COVID-19 has further exposed the strong association between race, ethnicity, culture, socioeconomic status, and health outcomes. Racism, segregation, and inequality have been invisibly and pervasively embedded in dominant cultures and social institutions for decades. And also under BAME, we subsume the intersections of race, sexual orientation, gender, abilities, disabilities, class, religion. So what term am I suggesting we use, you may ask? We're not one linear thing for sure. I have to tell you, I don't have the right answer. <laughs> I'm saying if we use the term, we need to unpack it each time and we need to acknowledge the nuances and the problems and the issues with the term. Some people say persons of color or POC as it's known, which is problematic for, for some. I actually prefer the term global majority of which black and brown people are the global majority in the world. And I use it in my writing as a rejection of the acronym BAME, where black and brown people uh, exist in relation to whiteness, which is situated as normative, whiteness is normative. So when, we have to, when I have to use the term BAME, B-A-M-E, as most statistics are based around the term, I spell out black and minoritized ethnic. I actually use the whole term. Uh, and I challenge the acronym that reduces the larger part of humanity to four letters. And I will leave you with this in terms of acronym. Does someone want to talk about the acronym LGBTQI plus and the new term GSM I've discovered, which is gender and sexual minorities? Maybe I'll leave that for another term. Thank you for listening. Amazing, Lorraine. Thank you so much. Uh, before we quickly go to Simeon, um, something that really jumped out to me, and, and I hope we have time to pa unpack this later, was um, when you were talking about this whole thing about BAME. I'm, I'm really jumping out a bit to talk about that later. But there was this whole thing about the um, intersect of experiences, power, and othering as well. And when you talked about how those different um, not using BAME because it almost seems to kind of not just infer just power with another group, but how other, you know, the blackness or coloredness is, is othered because like you rightly pointed out, you know, Irish and the Welsh are a minority as well. But when we use BAME, we are othering people of color. And, and so that was really fascinating. So thank you for, thank you for that. I hope we will come back to that. Um, Simeon. Lorraine, that was really amazing. And as a minority person being Greek, I think we can have a discussion around that, yes? I'm a migrant as well in this country, arrived in 1998. And, and um, I think that uh, we are here today to discuss intersectionality, but in a way that intersects, I think, multiple identities. We're having a LGBTQ plus um, week month this month, but also at the same time Black History Month, I think, in the US, which uh, I remember Crenshaw actually tweeted and said, I'm here for any other month, but this month, if you want to talk about um, race and racism, which actually makes the point of how universities and how academics are actually rising to the Black History Month. Let's do something about this. It's a tick box exercise. Uh, I think that the values, um, you know, uh, conversation here and the talks actually trying to, to go against this stereotype, which is we don't discuss things every month, but we're trying to actually, you know, engage with conversations monthly, but also in our different committees that we have, hence the notion of intersectionality, where we blink, you know, the notion of, you know, um, BAME groups, I used to say as a scholar, I started with the BME when I started back in 2000 as a PhD student uh, at Exeter University and, you know, moving through the ranks in different, you know, different ways. So um, I, 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 I'm not going to go through the demographics because I'm going to go straight in. I want to have a conversation discussions, but I want to concentrate on the neoliberal, neoliberal view around post-racial society that we live in, but also the neoliberal view that we live in a post-homophobic society, you know, that these things do not exist, 
we live in a society that discusses around race and racism has been criticized as unnecessary and dated. The same with homophobia. And um, yet incidents and controversies related to race and racism in all spheres of black and Asian minority, minoritized actually, Lorraine, um, uh, ethnic groups' lives become increasingly evident with the emergence of political campaigns such as Black Lives Matter globally. Not only that, one can actually only look at an advert that from a very famous chocolate company, UK based, where two men sharing chocolate actually I think attracted 50,000 complaints. So that notion of post-racial and post-homophobic societies do not engage, do not exist actually, to be honest with you. It is a neoliberal, neoliberal tend to take us away from real issues and real problems. And um, when I prepared this talk, I had a lot of things around the sectionality and around you know, defining and definitions of the sectionality. But Lorraine, you mentioned those quite well, so I don't want to repeat things. I think it would be good to actually engage with conversation after you know our five minutes and seven minutes. I want to talk a little bit though around the notion of whiteness, especially, and especially as a white, visibly middle class, I think, man, talking about race and racism as a scholar, but also as a leader within a, you know an institution in a higher education landscape in the UK where um, whiteness actually is not a culture, but a social concept and a racial discourse. And I will use, because I think, Obi, we had some conversations and questions, sorry, some questions that some people raised about, can you give us, a, you know, a, like a book or something to read around this? I always give this to my students, and it's a, a book that public was published around two years ago, but resurfaced again, because the New York Times mentioned it back in July about educate yourself. And it is the book by um, Remy Edo Lodge, where it says, why I'm no longer talking to white people about race. And she talks about the notion of white privilege and mentions that it's very difficult to define an absence. And she went further to claim that describing and defining this absence means to some extent upsetting the centering of whiteness and in a way reminding white people that what they experience is not the norm for other people in society. And it is the main thing that every time I give a talk around race, racism, intersectionality in forums like, you know, higher education forums, meaning like conferences or research paper, I always start by acknowledging my privilege, by acknowledging my whiteness. And I need to say that I'm certain that I wouldn't be where I am in my career, okay, if I wasn't white, and if I wasn't a closet person in many higher education institutions where my sexual orientation was never discussed, especially in Russell Group institutions back in the 2000s, okay? We're talking about early 2000 here. So I wouldn't, and it's actually quite important to acknowledge that, that my gender, the fact that I'm male and white, has taken me to this journey. And it's very important to discuss this. It's also quite important to discuss not also the notion of BAME, but the notion of hard to reach communities, where I had to talk to people that hard to reach communities do not exist. You create hard to reach communities based on mm, basic discourses that have been developed in society and from governments. It's hard to reach communities to go into Asian populations and talk about the disengagement around sport and health, not the fact that the structure itself doesn't allow that engagement. And finally, I want to talk about the fact that intersectionality is real and it's affecting people different. And homogeneity is wrong. Being me as a term, I understand for statistics reasons it can be used because it provides some sort of a, a, you know, a point of reference to start building something. But it is wrong. It's complex and it's multifaceted. If you intersect also sexuality into this, it's even more complex. Not, to be honest with you, a gay black male experience inequalities in a different way that I believe a black male does. Or I used to say in my research, for example, that affluent Muslim women 
experience structural inequality is different to actually what I call women from social deprived backgrounds that they are Muslim. So creating an umbrella to me is wrong. Understanding how intersections work is key to address also student bodies and the issues of the student body within higher education institution from funding to outcomes, to progression, to awards. And one size does not fit all. And one size does not fit all BAME groups. And finally, I love Idris Elba. I don't know if you know Idris Elba, an amazing actor. He said once, talent is not enough without opportunity. And I know that there are very many talented people that they have some intersecting identities, that that intersection of identities does actually not allow them to progress. And I'm going to stop here. Wow. Thank you, um, Simeon. That is a lot to unpack there. I, you know, again, um, a lot of the things you said resonated because when you're actually talking about um, a black, Okay, person. I was like talking about me, me, me. The way I have ex and, and and the way I have experienced um, the way I experienced race um, um, is it's it's different because of, of my sexuality um, as a black person, but as a black African man, that layer of um, the duality of that. But on top of that, my sexuality as well. Um, I, I grew up quite, you know, w raised in the working class, and then for my education, some of my friends, the people I grew up, consider me. Um, um, middle class compared to them but my experience it's it's uh, just so many layers and and affects the way that I relate on top of that religion as well growing up in a quite a religious family so that's really shaped my ideas of of, of race my my approach to my sexuality um how I think and how I feel about myself so yeah again thank you very much for raising some of those topics and Simone please sorry Dion rather Dion not Simone Great. Um, I definitely do want to unpack what Lorraine was talking about in terms of how Black, there are layers to being Black. And in a lot of research, the reason why we can't help our community sometimes is because you're not looking at the individuals inside the community. When we look at, um, I was reading uh, Slay in Your Lane, the Black Girl Bible, and they were talking about in education, when we're looking at Black grades, we're not looking at Black Caribbean grades and Black African grades, because in that there is a significant difference that our Black Caribbeans are slightly lower than our Black Africans. And we need to look at the, what is the difference and what is happening between that and how to target and increase their grades. So I think that's a very important thing we need to discuss in terms of how does that really intersect? Because in our cultures, it's a bit different. And that is a part of our race because of that's, sorry, I'm a bit flustered. Um, those things really contribute to us as people. As well as that, I wrote down um, white privilege in particular as something that being not necessarily, I don't know how to put this in a, in a particular uh, politically correct way, but being white, sometimes people are very like, we're as black people, Asian people and other types of people are going forth to educate them. And that was like what Simeon was saying in terms of hard to reach areas we're not hard to reach we're actually if you come and approach someone we're very open and if you're very humble enough and saying I may not know certain things about this they don't put themselves out there to come and meet us at where we are and when we talk about the intersection of I am a black <laughs> woman and in that I have things that hinder my hinder my opportunities as a woman because I can't not that I can't openly say it's difficult for me to say I want as many children as I can an employer will look at me as this woman is not going to be in work a lot if, and will look at my work rate and how much they would want to invest in me they wouldn't want to invest in me that much because they feel like I won't be able to be in the office and being in a part of my career as I should be and as a woman I don't feel like my dreams of being a mother shouldn't hinder my dreams of also being an educator and working with other children. So there's a lot of things that we can, I, we can discuss about that, that I'd wanna impact talking about how employers look at us regarding sexuality, race. Also another thing is society has views on what your race and gender, what you can explore. Cause I know as a black um, African woman, Someone will say to me, you can't explore 
wanting to have sexual adventures with different genders or you can't view yourself as if I said um I don't identify as a woman I want to identify as something else or I don't feel like gender really applies to me because me as a person isn't about what genitalia I have or what whether I fit in a category or box and a lot of employers and businesses take sexuality and race as check boxes like we have a BAME person in our office and we have an LGBTQ in our office. We're diverse, we got this, we can progress. No one can ever come and cancel us because we'll pick up this person and say, no, we have her in our office and we have one of these in our office. And I think those things are really important to look at as before anything, I just wanna be me myself. I don't wanna be the gay black woman or the gay black man or the gay white man. Like I just wanna be the educator finish I feel like we need to get to a place where we remove our extra titles and we're just what we are as professions or people thank you Dion thank you so much for that again I like you touching on this whole kind of identity um that how we as people can um hold different identities but sometimes um I think you touched on this like there is this reluctance to be allowed to sit in those different identities and, and, and to be those different identities. I think in many ways, maybe people are comfortable or organizations are comfortable for us being one thing, one linear thing that they understand that they can, I suppose, um, contextualize and conceptualize and then recognizing that we intersect, uh, there's so many things that intersect into our, our, our identity that to make us a, a black woman in, has multiple identities and multiple experiences that feeds into it, not just one thing. So, and so in many ways, that is the complexity of us. And, and I think for, I suppose for other people who are not, who are not suppose, um, who are not those people who are say, black, there is a challenge then as how do you, how do you sort of relate and how do you engage with people that have, you know, that are sort of uh, minoritized groups and have different identities? So I want to quickly go back to the group. So to open it, by the way, um, please, please, um, if you're listening, you want to ask questions, please put it in the Q and A. Um, I will be looking at those and, and try to get those questions to the panel and get them to answer them. Um, so I just want to quickly say to the group. Um, one of the questions I want to ask is, um, so how do you try to understand the importance of intersectionality in, in the lives of your own and others? And I think this is particularly used because Dion talks about that tick box exercise. And I think how, you know, maybe if we start understanding that a little bit, that might help organizations and other people to be less tick box and performative in how they relate to intersectionality. Um, who wants to, who wants to take that first? Shall I say? Rain, you want to go? Oh, sorry. <laughs> we're, we're all being polite. Um, okay, so in terms of intersectionality, my, um, I actually think it's, it's actually a lot easier if you are a minority, minoritized individual to work with intersectionality because you are very aware. I mean, I'm British, I'm, my mum's Irish uh, from Dublin and my dad's from the Caribbean and I was born here. So, and I'm heterosexual, uh, you know, mixed heritage woman. And I have described myself or I have been described growing up, I, uh, people call me half caste or you, you know some quite derogatory terms actually as well and not and not only um Dion I think uh, you you addressed this a little bit earlier on around colorism and I mean that could be a whole other <laughs> that could be a whole other debate but I was quite aware even though I'm a fair-skinned girl and woman I was quite aware that um or other people may be very aware that I was not the usual uh, sort of normalized even though I had a white mum and my mum was Irish so she never felt like she was um you know part of the majority either even though visibly of course she looked white so she could operate as a white person as a white woman so I think intersectionality actually forms my very being um, because I'm very aware of my fitting in and not fitting in and then as I've got I'm a mature a mature student I came to university uh, you know much later in life 
And it, it's really when I understood the theories of race, um, I could put the theories of race to my own personal and emotional understandings and feelings. Um, I then I now operate totally on intersectionality. When I look at things, I, I really do look at, because I'm an example myself, and I, like I said, I spell out, um, I use global majority, I read out the term black and ethnic minority. So those, they're, they're small things, but they are things that I can do to, you know, in order to operate in the world. So that's how I, that's how I address it. And I think just to go back to, I am um, minoritized and I think it's, it's a bit easier to, to deal with intersectionality once you know what the term is. Because I don't think we, I didn't know what the term was until I did, if you know what I mean. So I wouldn't have said I'm intersectional. And, and this is key, if I may, because it's key in the fact that very few people will actually understand intersectionality. It actually came out from the, you know, critical race theory movement and how we actually look at, as you said, um, uh, Lorraine, from, you know, the notion of Gremsor work around, you know, feminist and black. And, and, and this is actually quite important. I think the key here in terms of intersectionality is voicing the voices. Now, it is, sounds so um, patronizing, but if it is employed in the right way, then I think it can actually create that space where intersectionality can be heard. I mean, Dion can, 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 can mention this. Is, uh, uh, we are trying very hard to voice those voices at different levels at very high level as well, to engage with that different voice, not in a tick box exercise, but in, a, you know, in an engaging way. You know, I'll give you a small example of this. Um, we had a feedback from students, the EDI rep students, and around you know, Black History Month and how it's been taught within our research teacher training programs here. You know, outstanding and one of the best in the country, I must say. However, you know, you always can learn and you can always can progress. And this is a mindset we, we all need to have. You know, knowledge is always there and we can always get better. And I remember there were students who actually mentioned, said, you know, as black female students, we feel there is a big gap here and we need to address this. We think that it ought to be taught in that way, that way, that way, that way. And we're taking concrete steps to address this. This is another issue in terms of, and issues of intersectionality were mentioned from our students around, you know, that, and especially, you know, the notion of being a student rather than a black gay student or an Asian straight student. It's, it's almost like taking, you know, a, a much more open way, respecting that notion of intersectionality. But I'm going to go to my own self when it comes to intersectionality and being in very male-dominated uh, committees in the sports world, everything looks like me, but totally different than me, okay? Where a different accent created a very much othering exercise, which was like, oh, sorry? Not even sorry. Say that again? Don't understand it. What do you mean? Using derogative works around, you know, female and male, you know, and trying to be part of this was very, you know, didn't want to. So I tried to actually understand that my intersectionality within my own self defines me and that's what I need to start doing and also doing work with BAME and hard to reach communities UKRI and Lorraine we test that now UKRI the UK Research and Innovation Office still uses the word hard to reach communities okay doing work with hard to reach communities made me understand the different levels of intersections anyway I'll stop now Thank you, um, Simeon. Um, Dion, do you want to add to that? If not, that's fine. Yes, I do. Um, in terms of employers, and but before I get to the employers, but that idea of hard to reach communities feeds into the stereotype that black and brown people are antisocial. We have the idea that we definitely always um, exude antisocial behavior and also underlining having a lot of attitude because when you're hard to reach, that means you're very nonchalant. That means you don't care about a lot. Whereas say, using that type of terminology feeds out into the world that those microaggressions that a lot of people don't talk about enough or maybe don't even know about enough to be able to be spoken about. So I think we need to also as people work on the terminologies we use. And I think that's what Lorraine was talking about a lot about how we address these things because 
they have underlining microaggressions underneath them that could just pass you on in every day. And in terms of ideally in an ideal world to get a job, you'd want to not have to say what race you are or not have to say what sexuality you are. But obviously for surveying purposes, um, they matter. But partially, if you could just get a job off your merits alone, I think the dynamic in offices would look a lot different in terms of the amount of hard work. I, I feel like BAME communities put in to get their qualifications, the workforces would be just situated in a different manner. Because I know a lot of different people want to be different things, but because of their sexuality, they're not given the same opportunities. That's why I know a lot of people may hold back saying their sexuality just so they can get a bit further, then they'll say it when they're at the top, because then no one can say anything, I'm here now, I'm comfortable. So. I think that's another thing we could discuss in terms of employers not being able to, people not being able to talk about their sexuality until they get to where they want to be in life. And I think that's that's kind of sad for them. Do you know what I mean? Sorry. Yeah. Um, thanks, Dion, for that. Um, just wanted to quickly say about this kind of whole thing about intersectional, intersectionality. And I think it's a, it's a great way that we can sort of really think about how we connect and relate to other people. Um, Richard, um, Richard in the comments said something, about, Richard Bailey said something about engaging with different groups of people might improve, improve things the way we, and so they can talk about the experiences, i.e. white, black, gay, straight, Christian, Muslim. I think that's good. And, and the thing I like about intersectionality is for me, it offers us this points of connectedness, points that we can connect with people who won't necessarily be black, but we can have, maybe we can have, um, they might be um, LGBT, a part of the LGBT community. So that's a point of connectedness. If we're trying to move towards this environment where we really think about building a society or a world that is really inclusive, we're all different. We're, all, we're not all going to have the same experiences or the same identities, but you are going to be intersections. And I think it's, it is great that we have these discussions so we can find this point of connectedness and connect with people um, 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 at those points. So Dion, you and I, you and I, um, uh, 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 you know, you, your, your, your uh, gender is, it's, 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 it's a um, female, but our mind is male, but we have this point of connectedness that we are, you know, we're black and we're African. So we're going to have things. And I, and I think it's this point of in, interconnectedness really, understanding finding them it's a really good way that we can start building these bridges um also i just wanted to say in terms of um kim talked um i was posted a question about um the question i read it the great black, black gay american writer james baldwin wrote in the late 1950s the sexual question and the racial question that have always been intertwined in his novel giovanni's room um he equates whiteness with heterosexuality and blackness with homosexuality. In other words, both blackness and homosexuality are othered and feminized. Um, and she says, I am a woman, a white woman, and teaching this to um, level six English students, any thoughts? Um, before I will throw it to the panel, to, 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 I, I just want to quickly talk about, I remember reading um, Giovanni's room when I was um, 15, 16, um, growing up in a very African and very Christian religious family, where we went to church twice every Sundays. We went to have Bible, Bible studies three days a week and fasting and prayer Saturdays and, and night vigil on Fridays. It was tough. I would have to sneak and read my books, wake up really like two o'clock in the morning to read my books and I hit them. And I remember reading this book and it's interesting um, at that point and when I read it, I was really like, oh my God, I'm really discovering my sexuality and you know, this, you know, um, and going back to you now and revisiting that and this idea of like, you know, the, 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 how whiteness um, is equated with heterosexuality and blackness with homosexuality. And it's, it's again, it's this idea of this majority, you know, major, um, heterosexuality and whiteness being the majority and blackness and homosexuality being kind of the minority of the group. But also I, I, I guess in his novel in that maybe there is an attempt to convey the difficulties and the challenges of being black and um, and and also uh, and homosexuality there is a challenge that in, in at that time. So I I, I think there was perhaps an, an effort to synchronize those um, uh, the blackness and homosexuality to convey the challenge and the difficulties of it and how it, it is to be in that in the in that space and to be those people. Um, I just wanted to know if anybody else wanted to 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 add to that. I definitely can jump in there because. Um, one thing, black people as a community, we're othered by white people. And it's so ironic to me how 
when we have people that come out as homosexual or gay, whatever, whatever they want to be, in our community, we other them the same way we were othered by white people, which is for me is just so ironic because it's like you know how you felt when you were segregated, pushed aside, feelings and made all these stereotypes about you, you just couldn't be your your skin. I feel like sexuality is the same thing. You just want to be yourself. And I think that type of, uh, that situation there, I, I get that whole similarity between blackness and homosexuality because the same way we're othered, you're othering others even more. So yes, 100%. Can I, just, can I just say two things? Um, one of those things was at the Kimberly Crenshaw um, meeting uh, when, when she was here. What was really interesting as well, one of the speakers, I can't remember her name. Maybe you know her name, Obi, the founder of uh, Black Pride. Yeah, um, Phyllis, Phyllis Okuru. Yeah, and she recounted when she went along to the Pride movement to speak to them about, you know, having a black pride and she she said essentially they used her words and the second one was off and uh she found that she she had a talk about that what dion was just saying about othering in in the community that 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 there was a recognition that black people who were gay needed something from pride to make you know obvious and clearly sexual sexual orientation being othered but they said to go away and the other thing is, in my experience with quite a few students over the years, um, I've had many students speak to me about being gay and being black. And absolutely, they, they will not come out to their, to their parents or their parents might know, um, but they don't know. And the difficulties and also, to, I have to be honest, within the classroom, that we, I'm a social scientist and I find we teaching people who want to work with communities. And it's really quite interesting that the, cl the classroom can be a really oppressive space from other older, normally older black uh, women, some men, but we generally have women who, when uh, my friend's a social worker and she was talking about the self-harming of some young black people, she works in East London, due to not being able to come out, et cetera, and taking drugs and, and cutting and things. Some of the students were absolutely aghast that somebody, these, these black African students that I remember in particular, the older ones, that anyone could be gay. That's what, that's what white people do. And so therefore the youngest, some of the younger students who were gay felt that they could never come out in their communities because of those attitudes. Hence, this is why uh, young people are cutting and taking drugs and, uh, you know, kind of going into that behavior and mental health issues because there's a, there's a, um, and you'd know this better than me, Obi, but that's certainly anecdotally for me that the stories I've heard from students over the years about them trying to come out in the uh, African and Caribbean communities, and that's down to Christianity largely, which is a white religion. But anyway, let's not go there. <laughs> yeah. I Totally, Rain, and, and it's, I can't say that my experience was nice trying to come out. It, it took me most of my, you know, I hid most of my teenage years and my 20s and 30s. It was only when I, I like got to a point in my life, I said, okay, you're a big man now. <laughs> you can either step out and, and live your life or, dis, or hide. And I have so many cousins and so many friends who are living their lives in closets and not wanting to share. And... Um, you only have one life and he, he, for me, you have to make the most of it. But um, I quickly want to go back to these things about this term. Um, term. Somebody um, anonymously um, posted a comment and they just said, uh, Lorraine mentioned LGBTQI plus and the alternative acronym GSM. Uh, and they said, I'm not a fan of GSM because um, it, it's got the um, word minority in it, which again, positions cis, heterosexual, monogamous people as the norm and everything else as other. That, term other is coming up quite frequently. Instead, I like GR, GSRD, gender, sexuality, and relationship diversity, as used by Megan John Baker and adopted by the British Psychological Society and the National Counseling Society and others. This I've never heard of um, GSM before or GSRD. So, you know, we are learning new things. Um, and, and I like that. And again, it's just this thing about this term, the importance of term and the othering. And so again, I, about power. 
you know, who has power and who is who is defining power. And I think when we're talking about BAME, there is this idea that we want to have the, the it's, it's the struggle, I suppose, is finding the right words to position us in the place where we have, or we are seen to have kind of authorship about who we are and the narratives of our own story. And that's why I think it's so difficult to find a term that fully um, encapsulates um, the different minorities that we have. So I want to explore this thing about BAME and otherness again and, and power, which you touched on really um, well, Lorraine, earlier on. How do we, um, when we're thinking about how we use and address minoritized groups, can there ever be a, a place where we'd find a term that will be that will be satisfactory? You know, is can we ever do that? No matter what we term we use, we will always exclude, you know, exclude or never capture the experiences of other people, such as intersectionality, I guess. I mean, that's, that's what I think, you know, and, 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 you know, I went through a time when I thought of BAME and I, I would say BAME, but in my head, I mostly meant black. <laughs> so, so, and I was like, no, 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 no. I, I mean, everybody else. So it, it, it's, it's quite difficult to find a term that will always do that because we are our experiences. And it's, so, I mean, can we ever do that? Can we ever find a term? And can we find a term that addresses the power balance? Do we need to, do we have to? Is, is, when does it become like we're splitting hairs? Um, I think you'll remember me saying towards the end of the talk that I don't have the right answer. I'm just bringing it up for, you know, for discussion because it's problematic because it's a phrase. It's, it's like man, woman, you know, they're, they're just frameworks and that there is just so much else like a frame of a house. There's so much furniture inside the house. It, it's, it's really difficult. Um, I'm not sure being you know, human beings, we are always contesting, always othering in some way, as Dion said, around, you know, um, sexual orientation within African Caribbean communities, etc. I think my, I'm not sure if there'll ever be a term, a one term, it would be fantastic if we didn't have to say any term. As I say, I, I say to my students, growing up, I was called half caste but I never felt half of anything. I had, you know, then I was, um, but now I can be mixed heritage, dual heritage, dual bi, I could be your new bi friend. I could be, there's so many terms I could pick for, I stayed the same color pretty much, apart from being in the sun. And yes, I have so many, I've been allowed, I can choose dual heritage, mixed heritage, biracial, dual racial, all of these, these uh, ways of being. I'd be coloured in South Africa. I would be black in America. I, so I'm not really sure. I, I, I'm all about, uh, I guess we do the visible thing, but I'm all about that you identify yourself and just try not to care about anyone else. Because like you said, you've got one life, but we, we do have frameworks. But my little challenge all the time is just to is just to challenge people's thinking and not just say BAME, just always problematize it. That's all I can ask people to do. But I don't think we'll ever have one. No. And I hope we don't, because I don't want to be just one thing. <laughs> and, and I think this is this is actually quite significant. Uh, caging also is quite you know significant. And I think that. Dion was referring to the notion of stigma that happens with you, you know, uh, specific groups in our societies and how this stigma actually is becoming a norm. And, and uh, I used to be in me and I used to be a me before. It's a policy, policy makers, uh, you know, um, way to try and capture data within a society for various reasons, either to create stigma and to provide a norm. So, uh, I think it would be very difficult to get out of the BAME, you know, frames in a way that it is, simply because it is now quietly, widely accepted as something that could capture minoritized populations. I think as educators, and I'm not going to talk about researchers, but as educators and leaders within a higher education institution, we ought to do what Lorraine said earlier when you talk about that specific terminology to acknowledge the complexity, to acknowledge the fact that it is actually multifaceted, it is not just one thing. And even if you take the Asian 
out of that DME. Even that in itself is actually quite, you know, multifaceted in that sense. And I used to say when I was presenting my work, when I used to be in this fascinating world of discovering, writing papers and presenting work, it's, you know, it used to be that, you know, um, even within, you know, Indian communities, people are different and there are intersections there. But what we do and what we have to do as educators is to acknowledge this and the way that we try to promote policies for what we call attainment gap, which actually, you know, it is a stigma related terminology that puts the blame within a specific group, okay, rather than the policy makers. Okay, let's let's get this out of the way. That's exactly what it is. Okay, and 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 it's trying to actually acknowledging that when it comes to addressing the world gap, we try to understand how different groups operate and what are these intersecting elements. So I am part of a, a, a London higher um, group tackling race in higher education institution. Actually, Lorraine Marcia is actually the co-chair of that. Uh, one of the 39 black professors we have in this country. And by the way, we have 1,900 professors, 19,000 professors in this country, and only 39 of them are black women. Okay, just to say that. And one of them is black, uh, sorry, it's Marcia, who was the first, first black professor in this country in sports psychology. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to tackle this notion of race and race in higher education by acknowledging that thing that not all our black students having the same needs, not all our BAME students are the same, and trying to unpack that within our reporting back to the OFS, making OFS understanding that problem that we have with this terminology, but also policymakers. And I think it's an incredible job trying to address that. Thank you, Simeon. Um, Dion, you, you, you want to add anything? You're okay. Um, yes, I do want to say that with all acronyms, well not all acronyms, with majority of acronyms you make, you are going to miss out a word. Sometimes you miss out or, or sometimes you miss out and, but you just get the, not the main, but the main words in there. But I think one thing you'll always understand is in those words, there's more to it. We have to look at, um, I think Obi mentioned earlier, the layers to you. So when we look at the layers to me, it's, I'm Christian, I'm black, I'm straight. But when you meet me, the most thing I'm, in my African, I'm then South African and I'm Zimbabwean. But on top of that, initially, I'll just tell you I'm African black. But underneath that, you'll understand there's more to it. So I think the, the actual term B-A-M-E is probably one the only term we can use right now. But when we look into research, you need... I think what we need to be doing is going into the layers when we're researching, make sure when, you're, when your research is divided, you're not doing black people showed 40%, it's black African people showed, black Caribbean people showed, then in the Asian people, you break it down to, so we really understand how this research can be used effectively and what areas we need to target. Because if we just do a black and Asian comparison to white, we're missing out a lot of issues in there it may be just one part of the the black african side that's pulling it up or the black caribbean side is pulling up the percentage or one side is significantly holding down the percentage and you need to target those areas but you won't see that unless you break through the layers so i think that's the issue what they're doing right now is that they're just they're using the words and holding on to the words and not going on going down into the layers so i think if we what what needs to be done in the future is breaking down and researching within the layers, not just within the topic title. Thank you, Dion. Um, I'm just thinking about time um, and we're just probably just gonna run over a little bit, but just to tie, I guess, what um, Lorraine, Senior and yourself and Dion have just said uh, about kind of acronym and BAME. Um, about two, two years ago, 2019, we did a study, um, a focus group, myself, um, Piri um, and Nina, um, we, we, we did a study with BAME students and to a uh, focus group just to understand the experience. And one of the things one of the students said to us was about, oh, when I say we don't like BAME, and it's like, because it kind of, what well, others us, but at the same time, they said, we like it or we want it because it helps kind of put the focus on us as well. So essentially they were saying like, 
we don't want to be seen because of our being, but we do not want to be ignored because of it either. So that's kind of a, a very, um, it's a very tricky and difficult thing to to, to navigate. But I, and I, but I think you mentioned it quite well, Dion. I think it's, it's, it's about, it's understanding that the nuances between um, people that BAME should not be an excuse. And I think that's what Lorraine is hinting at as well. BAME should not be uh, an excuse or any acronym should not be an excuse to not really think deeply and purposefully about each of the group um, um, that is within that group or any groups that we're referring to, who are the specific people, are they understanding them, acknowledging their own experiences, et cetera. Um, and I think that there is a tendency that when we use BAME that we might be lazy or ignore to think too further ahead and too deeply into who these um, frames might be referring to. And I said, even myself, you know, there's the times that when I say BAME, I'm really thinking about just black, black people. And I have to consciously remind myself about Asian and other minority um, minority groups as well. So it is about helping us. I think it, it is about finding that balance of, yes, we have to group people together at some times for, because of, you know, expedient to do things, but that should not stop us from going deeper and to really understand them about the unique experiences and the nuances within the different groups contained in that. And I think it's about making sure that we move beyond the checklist. You know, we're not just saying BAME, oh, I've said BAME, I've checked, but actually who are the people in your BAME? For example, educators and lecturers in your classroom, in your, in your lecture, who are the BAME students? Who are they? They're not just black, you know, they are, you know, Caribbean, uh, you know, they are um, African. And, and we can see like, when you talk about the grades as well, they all do different differently as well. So what works for one black, group or person might not necessarily work for another black person. So there are nuances and we should not um, ignore that. Um, just to bring to a close, um, I'm going to go back to each of you to, um, to just give a closing and, and statement, but also um, if I just want to add also as well, is that what advice would you give anybody really trying to learn more about intersectionality, you know, particularly those working with, um, you know, with diverse groups and students and people, you know, how they really can, can navigate that. So anything you want to, to say that might be really useful takeaway for people or books or anything that you might want to give, that'd be great. I'll start with um, Lorraine. Thank you, Obi. Um, in terms of uh, diverse groups, the, the one thing I would say there is to have a diverse group does not necessarily mean inclusion. So you might have a diverse group in the in your classroom that does not mean inclusion. So, you know. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So just be aware of that uh, in terms of your learning materials and what you do and how you operate, really. Um, and then the, the three things that I've chosen here, I could cho choose loads of things, but you know what I've really enjoyed and I think they're really accessible. It's quite an old film now, but I love it. It's 2004 and it's called Crash. It's the film by Paul Haggis. It's such a great film because it shows the, if the metaphor of a crashing a car, but the crash of cultures. It, it's, it's such a great film. So if anyone's got time this weekend to, to watch that, it's 2004 uh, Crash. And there's a great book as well by Ta-Nehisi Coates. I don't know if you, you know him. And it's called, it's called Between the World and Me. So that's spelled T-A-N-E-H-I-S-I. And then his surname is Coates, C-O-A-T-E-S. And it's a letter that he writes to his, um, his son uh, about growing up black in America. It's a really powerful um, book, uh, accessible as well. And then the last one I would say is Chimamanda Ngoji Adichie. And she's on the internet and it's called The Danger of a Single Story. She's written Americana. She's written several books, but she's a, she's a storyteller and she talks about Africa as a single story. Um, so that's me. That's, those are three things I'd say. There's lots I could say, but those three things. Thank you, Lorraine. Simeon? I've just wrote them down, actually, Lorraine. Thank you very much for that. I think I've seen Crust, to be honest with you, and I understand what you say about the Crust of Cultures there. Um, I think I would go with um, Remy Edrelodge, especially if uh, you uh, are a white person trying to understand race and racism and also the notion of white privilege. I think there are some significant information there for a person to understand that your normality 
is not everyone else's normality. It's really critical. And, and if you haven't watched It's a Scene, please watch It's a Scene to try to understand how another pandemic has actually worked out and how things were back in the 80s for uh, gay people and gay men within our societies, okay? It's a very powerful drama. And, and I know this might sound as chewing gum television. Actually, it's not. If you get into it, you'll understand what I mean. And then, and then what do you need to do? Engage. And again, I'm not trying to patronize anyone at all. It's just engage like you want to engage. Listen like you want to listen. And air and have the difficult conversations. If you don't have difficult conversations, I don't think you will achieve anything. Thank you, sir. And Dion? Um, I firstly just want to say thank you, Obi. If I was in front of you, do ballet, you know? Um, <laughs> um, for me personally, I'd recommend obviously Slaying Your Lane, the first two chapters, which is the introduction and education, and the second chapter is education. I'd recommend those two chapters to anyone because it really talks about not only a black woman experience, because the book is for black women, but um, it talks about just the black experience in education and how having different educators that look like you really changes your grade projection. Um, but putting yourself in spaces where you don't have the opportunity to be because in my friendship group, I don't, most people, my friends are like me, do you know? What? So I'm not in a position where I can educate myself on things outside of my no. I'm in my church. I don't know where I'm gonna find someone to teach me about the LGBTQ community because everyone in there is hard African Bible batches and they might even pray for me for asking. So um, it's putting yourself in positions where you can educate yourself on these things because the varieties of information are out there. Even if you feel like it may be uncomfortable, you might offend someone by asking them directly. A lot of, there's, a lot of different types of content creators out there. YouTube is a growing platform. People talk about their experiences and story times all the time. The information is out there. It's just whether you wanna know genuinely. Brilliant, thank you. Um, before I sum up, I'm just gonna say, Richard, I apologize. You did ask a question about cultural, um, cultural appropriation. We didn't get a chance to answer that, but I will say to my panel and um, panelists, if you do want to actually just give your thoughts on cultural um, appropriation by email, and hopefully we can send that off to um, um, Richard or share it with um, um, when we post um, the video. And so just to say thanks to everybody um, for um, for your opinions, for your for your thoughts, and sharing your personal experiences. It was it was it was great to to hear. And I just want to say again, I think you know it's it's great that we'd have these discussions. You know, we, we spend so, many, so much time talking about, oh, let's create spaces to have these discussions, but we actually never create these spaces. So spaces like these are very few and far between. We need them to have more of these discussions. Um, and also, again, for me, I think when we're thinking about intersectionality, we really need to think about connectedness, you know? It's about where can we connect with people? What are those points? You know, just because someone is Asian or, or black or, or woman or gay or straight, does, and, and, and that might be different to who you are, does not mean that there, are, there aren't other points where you can intersect with them. And the challenge is creating the space and creating opportunities that you find those points of interconnectedness. And that's the challenge, trying to create that. So um, that's your challenge for me, try and find those points of um, connectedness. And lastly, Lorraine said something about, um, um, you can have, be, have an inclusive, um, uh, you can have a diverse classroom, but it's not necessarily inclusive, and I agree. And I believe inclusive behaviours, not practice, is what matters. Is that about that behaviour, it's not practice, because practice for me is just the pedagogy. It's just, oh, if I do this and do that, and that's fine. But behaviour really comes, think, comes from the inside, and you really have to think about how you behave in and outside the classroom as well. Okay, so thank you so much, and um, have a great day and have a great evening. Thank you and welcome to our party. Thank you so much. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.